This is Remo Daily, your daily dose of inspiration. Our guest today is a documentary photographer exploring the relationship between us humans. She's a founding member of Inland, a group of 14 international photographers who all develop long-term documentary projects. A very warm welcome and uh, bonjour, bon après-midi, maybe to Melanie Wenger. Melanie, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Melanie, where are you uh, joining us from today? I'm in Paris. I'm at home. How was your day so far? It's, it's uh, Friday evening for you. What have you done today? It's Friday evening and I spent the day actually working on my latest story and preparing uh, all the field work that I'm going to start tomorrow. What's the headline of your latest story, Nina's? I am uh, following a collective of people that has uh, a sanctuary and is trying to save animals from the big food industry. Wow. Okay. We also sent you a question beforehand saying, show us the last photo you took. And I'm going to screen share this now because I think this was captured from way above with a drone. And it looks like a modern abstract painting, maybe on the first view, but what is going on here? This is actually taken with my drone from the sky from a series that's called Teaching Birds How to Fly. And it's containers. This is a picture of uh, the harbor of Le Havre, that is one of the biggest harbor of France, and all the containers that are ready to be shipped anywhere around the world containing food. Oh, wow. So these are food containers that are, are filled or are they empty? They're filled. They're ready They're to be filled. shipped. filled. So this is the exporting of French food, the cheese that we buy in the New York supermarket and we spend half a, a month's rent on that, that might be in one of those containers. <laughs> Absolutely. Or the wine. Fascinating. Why did you take that? Because it's part of my like bigger project on big food. So we consume animals, we eat what they actually produce. Is the next chapters of what, of what we are going to talk about today. Why are you doing this work? Why do you put yourself out there between us humans and the environment where there's a constant clash going on? Put yourself in front of hunters and in front of people, as you said right now, in the big food industry. Why do you choose environments that almost always contain some sort of bad news? <laughs> Bad news, I'm not sure, but it's not really about that. I think the main reason is that I'm profoundly curious about the reason why we act the way we do. I want to understand the world has, as it, it works now. I'm very curious to understand how people make decisions, how the world work against around the, these decisions. And I deeply want to know how things are, are made. So this, I'm driven by this curiosity. And I assume that other people are too. And so my idea is to go out there, get the information and show it to the people that are not able or have other stuff to do with their lives to discover it from the pictures that I take. Awesome. Your why is very close to our why. We want to know how the world works. We want to know how leaders are you, like you work and what, what is behind a lot of the current streams that change our work, that change our date. However, we will look at two of your works today, Sugar Moon and Penguin Beach in a second. Why trying to understand the world, going out there, showing people through pictures what you, what you experience? Why did you choose the relationship between humans and wildlife specifically? Because I think a lot of the reasons, the main reasons of what's going on now with our planet is related to the conception that human has of animals and wildlife in general and nature also. And for me, the link between human and wildlife and the climate crisis is the relationship that we have with them and the relationship also that they have with us. Like, it's important to take it on both sides. Yeah. So you're saying that a lot of the problems that are being discussed on the global stage by leaders now every day, our planet is, is changing, is warming, is reducing the spaces for wildlife uh, and also for us humans. A lot of that lies, the reasons can be found 
in the places that you're going to. So you're trying to get to the root of the problem. But you are, have been looking into interconnected networks of humans and what they do. You are not looking at corporate responsibility when it comes to sustainability. You're going out into nature and see what's changing them. And we're now looking together with you at an excerpt from your documentary story, Sugar Moon, where you spent years documenting trophy hunting and a trophy hunting and its role in the wildlife conversation and in the wildlife conservation and conversation between Africa, between Europe, between the US. And some of these pictures are weird to look at because this is a business and you followed this business to Texas to a man named uh, Eric and over three years covered what he and his circle of hunters is, is doing. You won prizes with that. You have been at, at the most famous photo festival, Isa Paul and Marge. Uh, this was published in many magazines around Europe and the world, including National Geographic. So let's have a look. And maybe when I open the first image here on, on the screen, please explain us first, why Sugar Moon? Well, how did you come up with that title? Sugar Moon is actually the title of a country song uh, a country music song, sorry, from Bob Wills. I don't know if you're familiar with the singer-songwriter that is originally from Turkey. And I called this series Sugar Moon for two reasons. First, because the ranch that I photographed and documented for three years is actually in Turkey, Texas. And there is this whole atmosphere that fits very well the songs of Bob Wills. And at the same time, this song speaks about this extreme confusion between, it's a love song, and between love and possession. And it seemed to me that that this trophy hunting place that I was do documenting what, or was also speaking about that, the confusion about between loving animals and wanting to possess them as trophies in your house. So this is We why. see a zebra being lifted up here in the air. What is going on? The flying zebra. The zebra actually is in a ranch in the South Texas at this moment, and he is being caught, so tranquilized from a helicopter by a crew of people that are supposed to transport him. So basically is being tranquilized and they wait for him to be back to stop moving and then they put him in a bag and from with the helicopter, they are going to lift him and put him in a trailer to transport him in another ranch where he is expected to be hunted because a client has paid for him. Because. So what you're describing here, and it, it, it was a, a little, even for me preparing this, I had a hard time wrapping my head around this. So there's people who get these exotic animals and they put them into a ranch in Southern Texas and then ship them elsewhere to other ranches in Texas or in the surrounding area to then be killed in a live, whatever, trophy hunting environment. So these are animals that are sold to be hunted, but everything is man-made in that process. Yes, basically. Actually, it's part of the exotic game industry in Texas that is actually huge. It brings back more than $1 billion. So there is a business, not all the business of exotic game is for hunting, but a lot of ranches are proposing this. There are 500 ranches that propose exotic game hunting in Texas itself. Some of them are uh, private and some of them are commercial ranches. So you can actually pay to go hunt exotic or not exotic species in Texas. It's a big industry. There is breeding involved. It's not just for hunting, but hunting is a component of this industry. And it, it the beauty and the horrific shock are very close together. This is a beautifully lit and composed image. And the fact that it follows the image that we have seen before makes it, is part of why it's so horrific. What is happening here? Here you have Eric, that is the owner of the ranch that I documented, Eric Grimlin. Mm -hmm. He's a professional hunter and he's also a taxidermist. And he is holding the trophy of a, of a zebra that is taking out of the trailer to put it in the room of his daughter because it's the zebra that his daughter hunted when she was uh, 15. So he's bringing back the trophy home to, to keep it home. Thank you. Let's talk about this 
image. I when when Jade said before, imagine the wild animal. You are for some reason giraffe popped up in my head. I just like to see the world from up above. But these are not wild animals. What is going on here? So you also have you can also find giraffes in those ranches. There are a lot giraffes are not really hunted in Texas so much because they are not really uh, popular targets. <laughs> and if I follow the words, I'm now I'm just repeating the words of the hunt of the professional hunter I was following. Giraffes are, are more the targets of uh, for women hunters, and so they are not very popular. Giraffes are not very popular animals to be hunted in Texas. That's a, a great phrase. I'll keep that in my and I have to process on this in my mind for a little while. Here we see uh, men praying. Is that before the hunt? starts or what is the, the purpose so here we are in the cowboy church that is in near dallas actually and it's it's a church that welcomes all cowboys and people that work in ranches and they can like the slogan of the church is come as you are and before the sunday mass there is a moment uh, in front of the church where only men are allowed and where they pray to thank god for everything that they brought to them uh, including animals and the cattle and uh, the good function of the ranch it leaves us it, it leads back a little bit to what you said about love and possession and about the confused relationship and you looked into bull riding as well as part of your documentary work. How is that connected to the, the other story, the exotic wildlife hunting? Uh, so what I'd like, I like to do in my documentary work is to follow a family, follow a subject. Here it's the family and the range of Eric Grimland. And from there, I follow all the customs, all the culture that is around it. So of course, when I document exotic game hunting, I will also document what their children are doing. I will document what their family are experiencing. And the fact that there is a, it's a deep Texan culture that is not only hunting, there is also gun ownership. There is also a very strong pro-Trump feeling down there that, and it's surrounding the family. And there is also bull riding, uh, rodeo, animal shows, and it's part of a culture that I try to document at the same time. And we I... saw here one of the young uh, bull riders and, and his mom. What you also documented as part of this family and their life down there is climate change, right? But this is as the, as the title of the image is Wild Wind Fire that you also account. Absolutely. Turkey, Texas is in the pen, Texan panhandle. It's very flat, it's extremely it's actually going through a very strong drought at the moment and for the past eight years. And there are a lot of wildfire, very complicated with the wind to stop them. And it's also a threat to the animals, the cattle and the exotic game. The last image we, we picked from this much larger series, this, this year long work that you did is this one, which is also, it tricks you into believing for a moment that this is actual wildlife. But what is really going on? This is a release of Axis deer. So Axis deer is absolutely not a native species of southern Texas. And Axis deer are here released in a ranch that, are, that, is, that has eye fences. So it's absolutely wild. They're actually captive animals. And they're released from a trailer. When you open the door and you have, this is the end of the transport. You've seen in the beginning of the story, the beginning of the transport of the zebra. And it's pretty much the same with every other animals. And this is like the opening when they arrive in the new ranch where they're going to be hunted. Before we look into your next story, to try to wrap this up a little bit, you've basically found a community of people that thinks it's totally okay to bring animals from other climate zones, other countries to the south of Texas and be part of the $1 billion industry by having them delivered around, having them shot, having them hung in people's apartments. And you said a 15-year-old daughter of the hunter is one of them. What do you think about the future of wildlife through the lens of this story? What's your sort of wording? The reason I wanted to like to document this is that I want to understand what part 
if, if hunting still had a part in conservation or, or if it didn't, if it was something that was supposed to disappear or if it's something that should transform. I myself don't want to give an answer about this. Um, but I do realize documenting this, that there is still a very big misconception and misunderstanding. And there are like pretty much the world is divided in two. And there is like one side that is the pro hunting side. And there's the other side that is the against the pro hunting, against hunting and pro animal side. And nobody really understand each other and communicate with each other and the only reason why i documented this story is that i want um, one side to see the other and there i want the communication to start this actually yes they are hunting them and this is like the part of the story that you can understand very quickly uh, seeing the pictures but there is another side of it that is difficult to wrap your head around is that some of these species are now in semi-captivity in Texas, but are not existing anymore in their original environment. There are some species like the oryx, for example, that completely got extinct in the wild and are just existing in Texas. It's not the only species. And so there are some initiatives that are done to take back some of these species and some of these animals to their original environment and in the wild, but it's going to take a while and there is no guarantee that it's going to work. But for me, it was interesting to document that, to understand the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. And we still have a lot to do and there's a lot of work to understand what's going to become. One of the amazing things about you and so many other documentary photographers, we met uh, Gabriel Gilberti here uh, on the show a couple of months back. He said, you don't take a side, you're just showing things. Of course, you're picking perspectives and uh, you crop things out. You take moments, but you're basically encouraging us to communicate and you're not shouting uh, for one side or the other. And I, I find that a fascinating thing that you achieved with this story. And uh, thank you for giving us maybe courage to reach out a little bit, at least. And thank you for sharing your mission also with us and just saying these two sides need to, at some point, we need to get together and speak to one another even if we don't want to. And the fact that this all takes place or the entire story and research took place in Texas is just a stark reminder of. So we had been looking at Texas just this week and looked in horror and shock and didn't understand. So thank hard cut here. We are now going, traveling with you to a completely different part of the world. Penguin Beach is the name of the second story you brought to us today. This was for National Geographic and the story is um, about a colony of African penguins. Hardly exists anymore, if I understand correctly. It is just the last colony left re resisting extinction in, in the very, very south of South Africa, Cape of Good Hope. There's a beach that is home to nearly a thousand pairs of penguins. And that in itself is great and is amazing. And it also sounds beautiful that there's this little spot for them left on the planet. But it became a tourist destination and people flocked there to take pictures and pose with the animals. We'll look this, into this right now. There's a hashtag on peng penguin, hashtag penguin beach. You can put that in Instagram, see the amount of people posting from there. And in your story, you say again here, we're in the same situation as with your wildlife research, blessing and curse. So I'll now share uh, the first image and let's travel with you to South Africa and understand the future of wildlife from these animals and the humans they interact with and their perspective. Why did you choose that? Why did you choose that place and this colony of penguins? This small colony of uh, African penguins in the Cape of Good Hope actually gathers all the different challenges that uh, conservation has in Africa. And for me, this story, just with a small story, it, it was making me able to speak about the bigger story, which is conservation. These African penguins are at the same time facing a different threats, like a lot of other species in, in, in Africa. They're facing overfishing at sea when they go to swim, and at the same time when they come back, and at the same time there is overfishing and there's climate change because their first food is small pelagic uh, fishes, so that's sardine and anchovies. And due to climate change, the sardine and anchovies have moved, the currents have moved them actually up the stream. And 
there, there's less and less food. So they have less food and there is overfishing. And when they go back on shore, there is another threat that is mass tourism. And that is putting a lot of pressure as well on them. So this story gathered all the challenges that there is in conservation on one species. And I wanted to tell that story through this very small story of this beautiful African penguin. I was in South Africa about, I think, eight years ago. And just like Rashad, uh, I'm also guilty of visiting these penguins. I have not been as close to them as the people we see here. I don't know if selfies were a big thing back then, but I definitely was there because it's in every travel guide. Everybody recommends to go because it's an exciting thing to see. It's the only place in the world where these animals can still exist. Um, but it's so obvious, of course, to take these pictures. How did you actually go about telling the story to show with the rest of the world. So you started on the surface, but what did you do next? So the problem was first that obviously the presence of human is putting a pressure on the animals. So if I want to document the story in that way, I have to myself not put pressure on the animal also. That would not make sense. So the idea was to build the story and document it without be being physically present or observing a basic rule to uh, behave around the wild animal, that is to stay three meters from the animal. The problem is when you do a, a photographic story, you might as well know it uh, as much as me, you have to be close uh, to the animals, especially underwater. So I started to, to work with traps, camera traps, that is not a real trap, it's just to take a picture, put them in different places, and also imagine another system to go underwater to take pictures without being ever physically present. Um, yeah. And we will look into this right now. You brought us a little piece of video that we will screen share here. What is going on here? So here we are trying to capture a picture of this very skittish African penguin underwater swimming. And so we are putting a uh, trap underwater that doesn't exist. It's not something that exists. So with my team, we invented a way to make a trap. So we put a tripod with a bag of sand on the bottom of the water, of the ocean, sorry. And we put a housing, the camera in a housing, and we put, we set up a time lapse for two hours. And we had previously observed for a very long time the patterns of the penguins to know where they were going every day and every morning to fish. And we were leaving every day for 15 days, every morning for two hours at sunset, at sunrise and every night for two hours at sunset, this trap. And after 15 days, we got one picture and it was this one. So this is the actual white light. This is how long it took you and how elaborate it had to be. Absolutely. Normally you could be present underwater and take a beautiful picture, etc. But since you have to do it in an ethical way, it makes it more complicated. And so we had to imagine the way to change our way of working to pass the story along to you. There's of course more. And I just wanted to take this look into the end of the to, to the end of the gallery a little while more. We're skipping some moments here. When we picked uh, through more, uh, two more images, what is going on here with the penguin? What happened in the meantime? So on this image specifically, this is a trap that I put in the garden of, of a big villa that is overlooking the colony of the penguins. We are after COVID. So I used also the contrast between before COVID and after COVID to document what happens when humans are gone because tourism stopped completely. And so the African penguin colony got rid of the humans pretty much. And so I came back and I put some traps there to see what the penguins were doing around when the humans were not there. And that was a very big wow. chance to understand this contrast. And COVID somehow gave me the opportunity to do that. And this is one of the penguins that settled in the that puts it, their nets, nest in one of the villas surrounding the colony where there is no humans anymore. And this is at night, it's going out, go, going around, discovering the villa. And he was captured without me being there one of those nights. 
fascinating. So there are worse wildlife here. And this last image takes us into a different place of the story entirely. Once again, what led to this? This image is actually on the table of a famous bird veg ve veterinarian. Unfortunately, this penguin was rescued on the beach uh, that was photographing, that, where I was photographing before in the colony. And this is a penguin that got assaulted, like uh, attacked by a fur seal. Because of climate change, there are less and less uh, big white sharks in the specific bay where they used to be a lot. And big white sharks are actually the big predator of Cape fur seals. And because they're not there anymore, there's a lot of seal and seal are the main predator of penguins. So they are like more and more attacked by uh, seals that's like another another pressure that they have to live with and this penguin was attacked and then rescued and he just underwent surgery with this veterinarian at the bird clinic and will recover and be released this is a good happy ending story thank you for bringing this to us uh, and just put it in the chat it's hard to look at difficult to watch but you're shedding a light on something that for the first time you were, it's just outrageous. There is, and I wonder, you went it out to figure out how resilient these penguins are. They have threats everywhere. We said in the food chain, in the weather, on their surface, because of the, us humans directly, then under the surface, because we like the climate change, that's of course human induced, leads to them having more, much more predators around it. It seems like they, everywhere they go, they're just bound to go extinct. How? Did you find any, did you find out about how they can, how their resilience is, what their resilience is rooted in, like how they actually survive? So this specific Boulders Beach colony of African penguins is the last one that is surviving this massive extinction of African penguins. The species is normally a bit around South Africa and there are like six different colonies. All the numbers dropped drastically in the past 10 years. Each and every colony lost thousands and thousands of them. The only one that is surviving is this one. And the explanation of the scientist is that this is the only colony that is in a no fishing zone. So there, there is around Boulders Beach, there is one, one marine protected area that prevents fishermen to go fish. So this is like preserving the food supply of this specific African uh, penguin colony. And why did this happen? It's because this colony specifically is a, an urban area colony and settled in a place that is near Cape Town. And so tourists can go very easily to, to see them. And because they are popular, they are more well known and this colony has been used to make an impact on the laws and the negotiations with the, the, fisher, the fisheries. So the idea of the scientifics now is to build other no fishing zones to protect the African penguins that are still there. Very few of them, uh, but so it, what, it might be too late. What we see here and what so many of us, myself included, have been guilty of to go too close to, to wild animals, which in it, it, this image is, it hurts in a very real way and it hits home to me, but you say it's, oh, this is also helping. This is also helping them survive. The fact that we are so close to them and that we, that there is tourism, that there is people from all over the world who see these penguins up close is actually helping them to survive. So again, it's a very complex story that cannot be explained just by saying, oh, this is good, this is bad. It's much more complicated. To, to try to, we have just been starting a conversation here and to thank you again for taking the time to share this with us. It's such an honor to, to talk about work with a photographer themselves while looking at it. It's such a huge honor and joy to do this with you. When you hear this question about what is the future of wildlife, which we picked for today's session, do you have, did you develop a sort of emotion to it? Maybe a, are you leaning towards more the cynical by now, as so many people are, because it's easy to do. do? Is there a positive utopia that you see in front of you? Where are you personally, what are you personally drawn to when you think about our relationship with wildlife after having this, done this work for so many years? I, th I think I see a very simple solution in education. I'm not so cynical, actually. I think it's 
it all starts in a very like there's many things that we can do and I also asked you people what you do but there is one thing for me that is extremely uh, important is to understand our relationship to nature and wildlife from the get-go like we were raised uh, and I think it's the case of a lot of people that are listening to in a specific relationship with wildlife we were raised also listening to stories about wildlife personifying animals and and going to the zoo to to be able to touch them and we also advertise do you want to go swim with the penguins and it's not so much like me too I want to go swim with the penguins and I'm not saying like you shouldn't uh, it's not what I'm saying I'm just we have an educational purpose now to actually change the way we perceive wildlife how we can learn also for their wildness from their wildness and this is the how it's going to change our behavior towards nature nature in itself if we understand how we behave towards them if we understand how it is important that they stay free and wild as we will change a set of behavior a style of behavior that is going to actually be hopeful for the rest of the planet because this is the main difference that we can make. Which is complex again because one thing that you're suggesting is that we expose us, our families, and our children to wildlife more to understand better how it works. But that also means we are continue to go close to the penguins and take the selfie. Maybe. So you're not saying don't do that. You're not saying don't go to that beach. You're I'm saying, saying go saying there. Not- Definitely. I'm not saying not to go. I'm just saying go ethically. Understand how you should behave towards them. Remember, they are a wild animal. Remember, you have to keep your distance. Don't go with your selfie sticks. I'm not saying don't go to the zoo. I'm saying go to a park that is going to behave ethically with animals. If you see a park that is proposing too many interactions with animals, take pictures with the monkey, that this is not an ethical way to behave towards wild animals. It's like you have to take responsibility and I have to take responsibility as well on what I do and what I visit and how I will behave with wildlife and not at all stop having any any interaction with them, just doing taking more responsibility towards it. Thank you. So this is a uh, thank you for ending on such a positive note. Yes to going to the zoo, if it's a zoo that does it right. Yes to going to that beach if you re- if you learn something that you can show others like you do. Yes to communicating uh, about what Rashad just put in the chat that this is a global problem that we all share in all parts of the world. There's interactions with plant life that are not that are not helping anyone. And thank you for bringing us such an inspiring message to say it's not everything you do is wrong. It's just we're slowly. We have to slowly change the way we communicate uh, about it and we look into how things are being made. Last question, uh, Melanie, before we give you all a little mini concert to go into the weekend together, how can we support you? The first thing I'm thinking about is definitely to just follow the stories, read the magazines, the newspaper, keep being informed about what are the ethical ways to behave, what are what is going on about the species. Yep. And yeah, follow the stories. There is National Geographic and other magazines that I work with and for. And you can also follow like our Instagram or our websites and see what what we are talking about. MelodyWenger.com at underscore MelodyWenger underscore pictures on Instagram to connect with you. An amazing photo reporter, documentary photographer on long-term projects that are hard to do. And I hope that we get to talk about your next story on Big Food. When you return to Remote Daily, it's a huge honor to have been hosting you today, Melanie. And I want to thank you for taking the time to be here. And happy long weekend. Good to see you all. Bye-bye. Good to see you. Bye-bye.